Okay. Hopefully this is the last video, maybe, hopefully. We're going to be on uh, leak control. But I want to add one more thing to the spill control, just real quick that I forgot. Uh, just want to make sure you understand and you need to know this, that uh, always continue to monitor the atmosphere with uh, gas monitors. And that's something that we've talked about before. And anytime you start seeing lower readings, uh, that might indicate that you are doing the correct actions. So keep monitoring the atmosphere, look for lower readings, and hopefully we're doing things right. Remember that. Leak control. Leak control is going to be offensive. Uh, spill control is defensive, so leak control is more offensive. Uh, it is need to know that it is used to contain, not confine, contain a product in its original container, preventing it from escaping. Most leak control tactics are offensive. Know that. Performed by hazardous material technicians. A leak. A leak is a physical breach in a container through which a product escapes. The goal of leak control. Stop or limit the escape contain the uh, release either in its own uh, original container or by transferring it to a new one. Know that. Often referred to as containment tactics and tasks determined by the type of container involved, the type of breach, and the properties of the material. Okay, normally personnel trained below the technician level do not attempt offensive actions such as leak control, but you need to know these exemptions. Know this. Some exemption might be if it's either gasoline, diesel, liquefied petroleum gas, or natural gas fuels. Know that. With these fuels, operations uh, responders can take offensive actions provided they have the appropriate training, procedures, equipment, and PPE. Operations level responders may perform leak control by activating emergency shutoff devices on transportation containers, closing shutoff valves at fixed facilities, pipelines, and piping. Just remember, when we're dealing with fixed facilities, piping, or uh, pipelines and piping, uh, sometimes it's better, if you remember from, I believe it's chapter 24, to contact the facility or the owner of the pipelines before we start shutting anything off. Uh, it is possible that if we start shutting things, uh, that we can make things worse. So definitely if we can get a hold of uh, uh, somebody that is uh, that owns that pipeline or that facility, that would be the better off case and let them close it. Okay, uh, transportation container emergency shutoffs. Leak control dictates that personnel enter the hot zone which puts them at greater risk. The incident commander must remember the level of training and equipment provided to personnel are limiting the factors in performing leak control. Under safe and acceptable circumstances, operations person responders may operate emergency remote shutoff devices on cargo tanks and intermodal containers. All right, cargo tanks and truck shutoff devices. You need to know that most cargo tanks have emergency shutoff devices. You need to know that. You also need to know that they are located behind the driver's side cab. Driver side cab. Activation of shutoff devices vary, but is usually as simple as pulling a handle or flipping a switch. Or it could be breaking a fusible device. By type, cargo tank trucks have the following emergency shutoff device configurations. Okay, one of the things you remember, high pressure tanks. Motor uh, Carrier MC331, that is something that you are required to know and you are required to be able to look at that tanker and know that that is a high pressure to, uh, MC331. Okay, you need to know that uh, emergency shutoff device is on the left front corner of the tank. Emergency shutoff device, left front corner of the tank. Some will also have one on either the right or left rear corner. Okay.
And just remember, we already said, behind the driver. May also have electronically operated shutdown device that can be activated within 150 feet. This device may also stop the engine and perform other fun uh, functions. Okay, non-pressure liquid tanks, MC306, something that you are required to know and also by uh, visually identifying it. Emergency shutoff device, left front corner of the tank. Now that behind the driver, behind the driver. So I'm going to also have one near the right or left rear corner. Some cargo tanks may have emergency shutoffs in the center of the tank near the valves and piping or built in a valve box. You also need to know this. For corrosive liquid tanks, corrosive liquid tanks, you need to know this. And you, do, you need to know that that is an MC312. You need to memorize that. You need to memorize the description. Remember a corrosive tank is a little bit of smaller tank and it has those reinforced rings around the tank. So it's a smaller tank, reinforced rings. But you also need to know that an MC312, they do not typically have an emergency shutoff device. Do not know that. Intermodal containers, emergency shutoff devices, gas service, high pressure, cryogenic intermodal containers will have emergency shutoff or bottom interna valves. The containers may have them depending on the manuf manufacturer or the owner. Responders can look for the metal cable running down the side of the uh, frame rail of the intermodal container or the liquid valve to have a fixed point away from the container. So you would pull the cable to activate the emergency shutoff, may be able to pull a handle or other device to activate the emergency shutoff device. Uh, fixed facility pipelines and piping shutoff valves. Fixed piping, uh, the remote shutoff or control valves can be operated to stop flow of product uh, to an incident area without entering the hot zone. Depending on the diameter and length of the piping, the significant amount of product may release some for some time before it stops flowing. Now we do need to know something I just rem reminded you is responders should not shut off any valves without the direction from the facility or pipeline operators. So make sure you know that. In most cases, on-site fixed facility maintenance personnel or local utility workers, they know where the valves are located and can be given authority and responsibility for closing them under the incident commander's direction. <clears throat> Operations level responders who are trained and authorized to operate shut off valves at their facilities in the event of emergency may do so in accordance to their SOPs. Uh, also know that they may be safe to shut off some natural gas lines. Meter is generally located outside of the structure near the foundation or on the easement near the property line. So if it's a gas meter, that's something that we commonly can shut off. Shut off valve and line valve located on the owner supply near the meter. Know that when the valve is open, that tang is in line with the pipe. In line with the pipe. To close it, take a spanner wrench, crescent wrench, something of that nature, and you'll actually turn that valve 90 degrees. Contact the local utility company when the gas has been shut off. Any emergencies involving natural gas uh, occurs. I'm going to add one thing about remote shutoffs. Uh, if any of these facilities may have remote shutoffs or something of that nature, just know that they may be marked in red. Remote shutoffs may be marked in red, and usually they are easy to find. Easy to find locations marked in red. So remember uh, to add that. All right, last part decontamination. Decontamination, page 1359. Decontamination, know this, essential activity that must be considered at any hazardous material or terrorist incident to ensure the safety of emergency responders and the public. Emergency decontamination should be established at all hazmat incidents. Understand what contamination means. Contamination, know this, transfer of hazardous material from persons, equipment, and the environment 
in greater than acceptable quantities. We need to know the two types of contamination. We need to know that you have direct contamination is contact with the source of contamination itself. That is direct. Know that. Cross-contamination. Cross-contamination, know this, is also called secondary contamination. Remember that. Contamination occurs without contacting the direct source. So I'll give you an example. Direct contamination. I go into a hazardous material incident. I get contaminated, which I've called as dirty. I got the product on me. I come out of the hazardous material incident, and I didn't get decontaminated well enough. So I still have some of the product on me. I leave the hot zone through the warm zone. I enter the cold zone. I still have this contamination on me. I meet up with you in the cold zone. And I start to transfer this product that's still on me to you. That would be a cross-contamination or secondary contamination. Containments may be solid liquids or gases. Contaminant hazards vary depending on the material involved, but may be divided into the following types. Chemical, physical, biological. Also know that contamination may be external on the outside of the body or internal on the inside of the body. Decontamination, also known as decon, or contamination reduction, know this. This is the process of removing hazardous materials, and that is to, know this also, prevent the spread of contaminants beyond a specific, uh, specific area. And it also reduces contamination to levels that are no longer harmful. Remember that. Decontamination prevents exposures to hazardous materials by removing the contaminants. Exposure. Exposure is the process by which people, animals, or the environment, and here's the key word, and I've told you this before, you are subjected to or come in contact with the material. The material may not have been transferred. Decontamination may not be necessary if an individual has been exposed to a hazardous material rather than contaminated by it. Decontamination is performed at a hazmat a WMD incident to remove hazardous materials from responders, victims, PPE, tools, and equipment. Anything else that may have been contaminated. <clears throat> Everyone and everything in the hot zone subject to cont contact with the hazardous, hazardous material can become contaminated and passes through the decon area when leaving the zone. Now we're going to go over the four primary types of decontamination. They're on page 1359. You need to know these four different types. We're going to start off with gross decontamination. Gross decontamination. Surface contamination is reduced as quickly as possible. Emergency decontamination. Emergency de decontamination is remove the threatening contaminant from the victim as quickly as possible and here's a key part to this, without regard for the environment or property protection. So this could just be taking a inch and three quarter line at a very low pressure and just washing people off. And you're not worried about the runoff or anything of that nature. Now, if you can, if you can contain or confine that runoff, then that's a good thing to do. But that's the last thing you're worried about. This is emergency. This is life or death. Emergency is definitely different from technical decontamination. Technical decontamination is a formal decontam uh, uh, decontamination. This is where we set up the zones where we walk through the decontamination. A technical decontamination will be in the warm zone. So this is using chemical or physical methods to thoroughly remove contaminants from responders and equipment. Know that it usually is conducted within a formal decontamination line or corridor following gross decontamination. So usually the way this works is you set up a technical decontamination, and that's that typical scene. Uh, see if we have a, something you can see. Maybe on page uh, 1360, something of that nature. You have at the 
uh, figure, uh, well, I believe that's 2667. So you have different steps. So you come out of the hot zone, and the first, whenever you first step foot in the warm zone, that is what we would call a gross decontamination. And we can use any sort of methods. The most common methods is soap and water with brushes, and, and so we're scrubbing you down top to the bottom, okay? That's where we're trying to move as much of the product as possible. Now, from the gross, you move into the second part. They're going to wash you again in the second part. And then you can have a third part. So it just depends on the number of resources and your equipment and training and so forth. But anyways, the first part would be the gross. And this whole area, moving through these steps, is considered a technical decontamination. You would have to have your technical decontamination set up prior to your entry team moving in. All right, so the next one, mass decontamination. Mass decontamination, here's the key word for mass decontamination, large number of people. Large number of people. So you're trying to decontaminate a large number of people in the fastest possible time to reduce the surface contamination to a safe level. Large number of people. So again, just moving over this, emergency uh, from gross decontamination, that's usually part of the first part of a technical decontamination area. Emergency decontamination, life-threatening. Uh, also, with that, you need to know that there is no de formal decon area. You will not have a formal decon area for emergency decontamination. And then technical decontamination, that's where you're setting up your steps. It's going to be in the warm zone. And mass decontamination, that's going to be a large number of people that you're trying to decontaminate. The decontamination uh, provides victims with psychological reassurance. Some individuals who have been potentially exposed to hazardous material may develop psychological-based symptoms even if they have not actually been exposed. Conducting decon can reduce or prevent these type of problems. Important to continually assess the effectiveness of any decontamination operation. If monitoring determines that the selected method is not working, a different technique might, uh, may be tried. Type of decon operations conducted will be determined by a variety of factors. Number of persons require decon, type of hazardous material involved, the weather. Uh, washing off contaminants uh, with a hose stream may not be a viable option in cold temperatures. Uh, personnel and equipment available. Terrorist incidents performing decon may require changes in procedures. Hazmat WMD incidents may be in, involve large number of people, uh, so that you can quickly assess for injury and exposure, uh, pass through a decon corridor, a corridor for treatment or safe sheltering away from the incident. Since terrorist incidents must be treated as a crime scene, any clothing, equipment, or contaminant materials must be protected as evidence. Know that. Any, anything like that, protect it as evidence. Handle in accordance with local adopted policies and procedures. Regardless of the many variables that may be encountered at the incident, incident, the basic principles, know this, the basic principles of any decontamination operation, know this, get it off, keep it off, contain it. 85% of the contaminant would probably be on the clothes. So if you've got civilians involved, one of the first things you may do is strip. And that might get 85% of the contaminants off. Now you're gonna to have to set up, hopefully set up an area, not unless it's emergency decontamination, but you try to protect the privacy and those things. But that part alone, just declothing, could take off uh, quite a bit of the contaminants. Questions before initiating any type of decontaminations. Do the victims need to be decontaminated immediately or can they wait? Is it safe to conduct a decon? Is there a safe place to conduct a decon? And what alternative decon methods are available? Are there adequate resources? What is the time limit available to conclude the decon? Is the equipment you're attempting to decontaminate going to be reusable? So those are questions that you must be asking. 
All right, let's get into gross decontamination, page 1361. Significant reduction of the amount surface contamination takes place as quickly as possible, traditionally accomplished by mechanical removal of the contaminant, scrubbing them off, or initially rinsing with the hose lines, emergency showers, or other nearby sources of water. Fire research continues to demonstrate that numerous carcinogens are present in almost all types of fires. Today's firefighters encounter fires with toxic gases, vapors, and particulates. Contaminate, contaminated firefighter protective gear increases the risk or, uh, for dermal contamination, the severity of inhalation injuries. So basically, whenever you got through uh, doing your live fire and you came out and you were done for the day, they may have hosed you off with uh, just scrubbed you off a little bit or washed you down. That could be a good example of a gross decontamination. Okay, recommended gross decon procedures. We need to know these recommended procedures. Use a soft bristle brush and damp towel to remove large debris. Removing all turnout gear if possible. Washing and or doffing the PPE at the scene. Know that. Here's another one. Use wet wipe, baby wipes, or wet towel to remove soot from your uh, head, face, jaw, neck, underarms, hands, and lower legs. Know that. Also, you need to know using a hand line to rinse off all your PPE and equipment. Know that. Uh, isolating, cleaning, and decontamination of all PPE, uh, PPE and tools. Uh, here's one you need to remember. This is something that you did. Machine washing structural firefighter protective uh, clothing and designated machines. And also showering immediately with soap and water thoroughly as soon as possible. Okay, so those are some things you will need to know. Gross decontamination is performed in the following situations. Responders exposed to smoke or products of combustion. Responders before undergoing technical decontaminations, victims during emergency decontaminations, persons requiring mass decontamination. The advantage is it's conducted in the field, so the uh, reduction of the contaminants is immediate. The disadvantage, while it may remove the worst surface contamination, it may not remove all the contaminants. Gross decon is not a complete decon. Know that. Gross decon is not a complete decon, and it should be followed with a more thorough decon. Emergency decontamination. Uh, let me back up. One thing that it did not add that you need to know. I'm on page 1361. Uh, oh, here. Well, I did say it. You need to know the advantages and disadvantages of uh, gross decontamination. The advantage conducted in the field, the reduction of contaminants is immediate, and the disadvantage, it may remove the worst surface contamination, may not remove all the contaminants. So make sure you know that. Emergency decontamination, the goal. Remove the threatening contaminant from the victim as quickly as possible there is no regard for the environment or property, so make sure you know that. Emergency decon may be necessary for both victims and rescuers. If either is contaminated, individuals must remove their clothing and wash quickly. Victims may need immediate medical treatment, and they cannot wait for the establishment of a formal decontamination. So, key thing in that, immediate threat to life. Immediate threat to life. Uh, examples uh, of instances where emergency decontamination is needed, failure of protective clothing, accidents, accidental contamination emergency responders, immediate medical attention is required by emergency workers. Advantages, fast to implement, requires minimum equipment, reduces contamination quickly, does not require a formal contamination reduction corridor. Limitations. Removal of all contaminants might not occur. A more thorough decontamination must follow. Can harm the environment. If possible, measures must be taken to protect the environment. 
but such measures should not delay life-saving actions. The advantage of a life-saving situation far outweighs any negative results or effects. Okay, so we know right there that something we need to remember, it may not totally decontaminate the victim. But we're worried more of the life-threatening, so you may have to later on do a more thorough decontamination. 